welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Connie Golden and I am a professor and the department chair of business management here at Lakeland. And on behalf of myself and my colleague, um, Dr. Gretchen Scope-Desano, say hello. Um, we welcome you to our first Learn From Leaders for the fall semester. So thank you very much for being here. So we are excited to welcome Dion Dimitro, who is the president and the CEO of United Way of Lake County. Dion is a lifelong resident of Lake County. She's a proud graduate of Harvey High School, earning her master's in education from Cleveland State. She has a career that is rooted in service to others. She began as a high school biology teacher at Mentor, and she spent some time working here at Lakeland. So we are um, really happy that we were part of her journey to where she's at today, and we are looking forward to uh, hearing her story. So help me welcome Dion to Learn From Leaders. Hi everyone, uh, thank you to Connie and to Gretchen and the entire Lakeland team. So I, I say this right up front for everybody because it helps me a little bit. Um, I'm a nervous wreck when I give presentations. I know it seems counterintuitive given what I do for a living, so I try to say that right up front. Helps calm me down a little bit. I also have said to Sam and Phil, when there's a video camera involved of any sort, <laughs> hello, I get a little bit more nutty, so bear with me. So as Connie said, part of my journey has certainly included um, being here at Lakeland and the thread that has tied all of that together has been service. Um, I was given a set of questions to sort of help guide the conversation. And the first one was to sort of talk about what is it that brought me into the nonprofit arena and how did I end up where I am today? And so I would tell you that when I was first considering what my career path would be in my undergrad work and probably even as early as high school, I imagined that my path would be something like this, right? It would be linear. Um, I would be able to see clearly where I was headed. And what I would tell you is my path looks a lot more like that. And that's a good thing for me. Um, you know, we hear that the current generation and, and maybe people a few years older than folks that are in high school right now aren't going to go and work in the same place for 30 years. It's not like it used to be. Um, I'm certainly living proof of that now as a 52-year-old. Um, when I started my career, I certainly thought that I was going to do one thing for the rest of my life. And it's really funny that Deb is in the back because I did start as a high school biology teacher and we were both teaching in the mentor schools 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, I would have told you that I will teach for the rest of my life and that's what I'll retire from. Um, I grew up in Painesville, graduated from Harvey High School. My undergrad degree is actually in environmental science. And so when I went off to college, I didn't think that I was teaching. Um, by the time I was a junior in college, I would have told you that I was going to be a soil researcher of all things. And then I ended up with my master's in education from Cleveland State. But what is probably more interesting is that if you look at my resume, it looks like I can't hold a job. And I, I say that you know, sort of to, to be snarky, but um, I've taken a lot of left turns in, in my career. So I started as a high school biology teacher, still the best job that I ever had, loved, loved teaching. Um, when I had my kids, I decided to work only part-time. It was really important for me to be a stay-at-home mom for as much as I could. So I took a job at Leadership Lake County working in their youth program, which again was a fantastic opportunity. And then I was here at Lakeland for almost 15 years, but while I was here at Lakeland for those almost 15 years, I think I held four or five different titles. Um, I was the director of student success. At one point I was helping with our tutoring. I oversaw our nonprofit center. I helped with special projects. So you know, I had a lot of opportunities here, which again was probably um, very pivotal to getting me to these next couple of steps. When I left Lakeland, I went to a political strategist firm, and there I was specifically doing strategic planning work, which is a lot of what I was doing in our nonprofit center. And then um, right before COVID, I did the strategic plan for a funeral home here locally that has rooftops in Cuyahoga, Geauga, and Lake County. And after doing that strategic plan for them, they asked me to come on board as the operations manager. And so, you know, biology teacher, leadership Lake County, Lakeland, those seem to go together. Political strategist firm, okay, if you're doing strategic planning and you're doing that, that seems like it. 
funeral home seems like a really sharp left for people, and I know that. Um, but what I will tell you is what I realized at the funeral home was that what has been most important to me in all of my jobs is to be of service. And so that is the thing that has drawn me through all of these. And then I joined the team at United Way of Lake County um, last year. So um, the, the one question about like how did I arrive in the nonprofit work, like I can explain to you that whole pathway in terms of the going from job to job, but I had the great fortune of having what I would describe as a very pivotal experience that put me on that track. And so I always try to share this when I have the opportunity to talk about my career pathway because I do think that knowing your core values is incredibly important when you're figuring out what it is you want to do the rest of your life for money. Um, I always say that life is both too long and too short to be miserable and we spend way too much time at work not to be doing something that we enjoy. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm an advocate for you have to find the ideal job that will make you happy 24-7, because I will also tell you through my lens, happiness is relative. For me, it's about peace, right? I need to do what I do as a vocation that allows me to put my head on my pillow at night. Um, so when I left from Harvey and went to Allegheny College in Meadville, um, I'm the first person in my family to, to go to college. The first time my mom was on that college campus was on the day that she dropped me off. Uh, I didn't have a lot of social capital when I landed there, and it was a very, very expensive place to be. I was very fortunate back in the late 80s. If you were poor and you had a good ACT score, you could go to school for almost free, which was sort of my situation, but I still needed to pay for other types of things. So I was working a couple jobs that summer. In the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, on the 4th of July, I had um, the opportunity to just work one of my jobs. And so I worked in the morning and I went and watched fireworks at night and I was very tired on my way home and I fell asleep driving my car and I woke up as I hit the curb and instead of punching the brake, which is what I wanted to do, I hit the gas and I went through the windshield of my car. And um, I'm in the emergency room, the doctor is picking the glass out of my face and as he's doing that, he looks at my mom and he's like, what is this thing on her neck? And I had had this large mass on the side of my neck for about a year and the doctors at the college kept telling me it was an inflamed gland and were giving me penicillin. And so I had said to the doctor, it's an inflamed gland. And the doctor looks at my mom and says, she has to see a surgeon tomorrow. And so what had happened is I had went misdiagnosed with cancer for about a year and a half. And um, the cancer that I had is Hodgkin's disease, which is highly, highly treatable if you find it in time. And ironically, the girl that I lived next door to in college, her senior year of high school, had the same exact type of cancer that I did. But she was stage 1A, which meant that she had the most treatable form. Her survival rate was like a 99%. I was, by the time I was staged, I was 3B, which meant the only place that it wasn't was in my bones. And so they told my parents to get my affairs in order. And I remember Jen had told me very clearly not to agree to chemotherapy, to get all of my lymph nodes taken out and do radiation so I wouldn't lose my hair. So I was an 18-year-old girl, and imagine sitting across the table from a person with a medical degree and arguing about what my plan of care should be, that I should just get my lymph nodes out because I don't want to go bald. <laughs> and he's like, you'll die. No, I won't. She didn't die, right? I'm, I'm literally arguing with a doctor. So that should give you a little bit of insight into I'm a very stubborn person and like borderline nuts. So I'm having this argument with this doctor and my mom says to me, if that's what you choose, because I was 18, she's like, you gotta go live with your dad. And she knew I wouldn't go live with my dad. They had been divorced. It was not an easy growing up. And um, I ended up going ahead and doing the chemotherapy. So I joke that for the next six months, I look like Uncle Fester from the Adams Family. I put on a ton of weight from the prednisone, dark circles under my eyes, completely bald. Um, it was a good time. And uh, I got done with chemotherapy. I know this isn't completely wood. 30 some years ago. And I've been healthy ever since. And when I got done with chemotherapy, I had to do a CAT scan, and then um, six months CAT scan, six months, six months, six months. So I finished on February 2nd. My mom gets flowers on February 2nd every year. And then the um, August, I do my next CAT scan. Then I board a plane, went to Costa Rica, do my study abroad. Now as a parent, I understand what I put her through to get on a plane to go do study abroad when I had just finished chemotherapy six months before. I came home, and when I came home, Jen's cancer had come back, and she passed away about three months later. 
And I don't know if it was the ignorance of youth when I was sick and going through chemotherapy, but I can assure you it never occurred to me that I would die as a result of my cancer, not once. And when I stood at the grave um, following Jen's visitation, I knew that whatever I did going forward had to matter. So when I talked to you, that, like I taught, and then I was at the college, and then I was helping with the strategic planning, and then I ended up at a funeral home, and then I go to United Way, for me, I've known from the moment that happened that whatever I did for money had to matter. So when I say like in the bio that my goal is to leave things better than I found it, it's not because I'm a great person, it's because I have guilt. <laughs> and, and that's not a bad thing. Like I understand in a very unique, personal, and tangible way that like my opportunity to be here today is special, right? And so for me, that is one of my core values. So I think it's really important what's helped me have peace in my job, and that's what I said was really important to me, is knowing that part. The other part that has been important, there's a question that Connie had said to touch on about like, you know, what's one of my professional struggles. I think the other thing that's really important for all of us is like, this is an ongoing journey, right? And to understand ourselves. So one of the greatest gifts I had was working here at Lakeland. And when I was here at Lakeland, at one point, um, I had the job of special projects. And under that job of special projects, Dr. Beveridge wanted me to look into what the research was telling us about what was helping students to be successful. Because the, the completion rates at community colleges aren't nearly as high as people would like them to be. So I was looking at the data, and I came across this concept of an adverse childhood experience survey. And um, what the adverse childhood experience survey talked about was 30 years ago, there was a pediatrician who realized that kids that she was seeing that were coming from backgrounds with um, severe poverty, they were more likely to have chronic illnesses. So it wasn't just like they were being exposed to lead in their house, but they had higher rates of asthma, they had higher rates of diabetes. And she wondered if there was a connection between what was happening with kids that were coming from poverty and their health outcomes. And the reason this was interesting to me is that when I was looking at the body of research related to student success, you could find a lot about the characteristics, the predictors for people not to be successful. So you're less likely to be successful if you have one of these four things. One is to come from poverty. By the time we were a junior, by the time I was a junior in high school, my entire family had to move with my grandparents. Um, we didn't have any money, so I definitely fit the characteristic of coming from poverty. Um, the other one is be the first person in your family to go to college. I shared with you that I'm the first person in my family to go to college. The third was to be in developmental education. So even though I had a high ACT score, when I landed on the campus of Allegheny College, I started in developmental English. I didn't know what developmental English even was until I came to Lakeland and read about it. And I was like, that's that class they put me in. And then the last one was to be a minority student, which obviously I'm not. But three of the four things I had that suggests statistically that I shouldn't have completed my degree or at least completed on time. And so I was more interested in how does someone like me become successful? How does someone like me navigate the system? So I started to read about these adverse childhood experiences. And it's 10 questions. You're a zero or you're, you could be a zero up to a 10. And it's questions like, did you ever go hungry? And it's just yes or no. So you didn't have to go hungry four nights a week, five weeks out of every three months for six years or whatever. It's just yes or no. Zero is the lowest you can get, 10 is the highest you can get. And what they determined was four is the tipping point. And what that means is if you have four or more adverse childhood experiences, you're less likely to earn your degree. You're less likely to be full-time employed. You're more likely to experiment with hard drugs. You're more likely to end up in prison. You're more likely to end up with mental health issues. You're more likely to develop cancer. You're more likely to have cardiac disease. You're more likely to die young. So it wasn't just like bad choices and you don't have good role models at home. It was life and death sort of stuff. Zero is the lowest, 10 is the highest, four is the tipping point. I'm a nine. I have a nine in my bathroom mirror, I have a nine in my car, I have a nine in my wallet, and I will tell you every time I think I'm screwing it up, whether it's a mom, a friend, person at work, I look at that nine, and I remind myself that statistically, I should not be here. But what the research tells us is that people that go through the Adverse Child Experience Survey people that have that sort of ongoing trauma, there is a brain development issue, right? So people that have that sort of ongoing stress, 
the frontal part of our brain, the part that controls executive function, that gets underdeveloped. And the part that is our emotional part, the hypothalamus, that gets overdeveloped. So impulse control, don't have it as well, fly off the handle, have it a lot, right? And, and that's what we see with some of these kids that are coming into kindergarten and those sorts of things. So when I would talk to teachers about it, I would say, you know, this isn't this sort of defeatist story where there's not anything we can do because the research tells us that there's one thing that helps anybody that comes from that environment, whether they're 3, 4, 5, 12, 23. And that is a healthy, positive relationship with another person. And so what I can tell you is when I look back, it wasn't about a program, it wasn't about a job, it wasn't about you know, accessing scholarship dollars. I can name for you the people that were in my path that pointed me in the next best position and made me feel like I was capable of doing that. So in my looking back and looking forward, relationships are everything. And when I looked at the research, there was a, a particular body of research here that, that I was doing at Lakeland looking at that was looking at folks that were starting developmental math classes. And it was an interview with people from across the country. And it was looking at folks that started developmental math and never should have statistically gotten to their degree. And so they wanted to interview all these people to figure out, you know, is it because it's a hybrid program? Is it because they were able to have a late start? Was it the wraparound services? Was it tutoring? Blah, 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 blah. And they interviewed all these people. And what they found out is that every single one of those folks that started developmental math and successfully navigated the system could name a person. It wasn't about the late start. It wasn't about the hybrid. It wasn't about anything other than people. And so for me, my biggest challenge has been in understanding who I am. The other side of that coin is that concept of imposter syndrome. So I will tell you, I suffered from that tremendously early in my career. The thought right now of standing in front of Deb Woodworth, who I taught with 30 years ago, and sharing that at some point we had to move in with my grandparents, and that I'm a nine, and da 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 da, that would have like put me over the edge. I spent so much time early on in my career trying to pretend that my background isn't what my background was, trying to fit in, trying to be who I thought people wanted me to be in order to be successful. And at some point, and I'm not entirely sure what point that was, at some point I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore because it was exhausting. And at the moment, I decided that it was OK not to be polished all the time, because I'm not, and not to be on all the time, because I can't be, and to give myself some grace, that made doing my work easier. And I want to be the best version of myself, show up the best version of myself, so I can help other people. So I think the key, there, one of the questions around you know, being an effective leader or those sorts of things, for me, it's meeting people where they're at. And that's whether I was a classroom teacher. You know, I used to always say that I didn't teach biology, I taught kids. You need to meet people where they're at. I think in order to be successful, whether it's you as a partner, a parent, leading an organization, you have to have empathy. You have to have the ability to understand what people are going through and what their needs are. Um, yesterday, in my organization, I have a person that works on my team. I adore her. She does fantastic work. She has busted her butt over the last four months to put us in a completely different position than we were a year ago. Could not do anything that we've done without her. Um, she comes into my office. She asks me a question. She sort of spins out on her heels in near tears. I'm like, you need to come back. What's going on? And she like, launches into this thing where she really, truly feels like I have dismissed her, right? I'm like, how so? And we talk about, like in our staff meetings, that when other people are sharing the details of their work, that like I'm asking a ton of questions, giving all this feedback, and then when she does, we just sort of blow through it. And I thought, holy cow, I do. But I do that because I 100% trust what you do. I don't need to ask questions. Like I don't even need to hear what you're doing, because I know you're going to knock it out of the park. But she was interpreting what I was doing as dismissing her. I, I was unintentionally hurting her. And so as she was getting ready to leave, she said, I apologize for being so needy. I said, absolutely not. I said, that isn't about you being needy. That's about you having a need that's not being met. And so it's my job in my role to know who my team is and understand what their needs are so I can meet them. Because if I can meet their needs, if I can understand their motivations, if I can help them feel valued, then they're going to be at their 100% and be able to help us move forward. But if I don't understand what they need, or if I'm accidentally hurting them because I'm behaving not from an empathetic standpoint, 
then we're not going to be able to be as effective as we need to be. And for me, you know, I feel this greater sense of urgency because of the work that we do at United Way. You know, we have to raise as much money as possible to be able to help meet the unmet needs in our community. So it's more imperative to me to be able to do that. But I think that piece about understanding others and being able to meet them where they are so that you can get the most out of your team is really important. I subscribe to the sort of idea of servant leadership. And there's like 10 different versions of this quote, so I apologize. This will be the one thing that I read because I'll screw it up. But there are two ways to have the tallest building in the town. One is to tear everyone else's building down. The other is to build your building taller. I'm very, very, very much about building. Um, I, I've worked with people. I've, I've been on teams with people who the way they make themselves look and feel better is to criticize the work of other folks. Everybody has different strengths. Everybody brings something else to the table. My belief is we just need to build, right? Um, I'm not interested in trying to figure out what other people are doing poorly to make us look better. I just want us to do the best that we can. So the one question was around mentors or, or folks like that. You know, like I said, for me, I've been very lucky in that along my path, I've had people that have tried to help me, right? And so I'm very grateful and very cognizant of the people that have had the greatest influence in my life were folks who made it a priority to make sure they knew where I wanted to go and help me get there. And so that's always been my philosophy as I've worked. You know, every time I'm in a new position with folks that I'm a part of a team, if I'm in a position to help them move forward, I want to know what their goal is. I want to know where they picture themselves in 10 years. I want people to outgrow me. That should be my job. I, I want people to be able to say, I have enough skill and everything that I've learned from you that I can, and now it's time for me to move on. That, that for me, feels like success. Um, but one of the, the best examples, when I was working in the death care industry, I had the chance to meet a gentleman, um, Jimmy Lucas, who owns funeral homes down in Texas. They have a bunch of rooftops. He's highly successful. He has a very, very large team. And I remember the first time I heard Jimmy present, he's the owner, and he's like second generation, third generation, I think. And every time he referred to somebody, he never called them employees. He referred to them as my coworkers. And I really think that that's incredibly important. I try very, very hard to never list my title on a presentation. I don't introduce myself that way. If I get invited to come in and speak, I will tell you I'm a member of the team at United Way of Lake County. I serve at United Way of Lake County. And I don't do that for shtick. I do that because it's important for me to remember I don't do anything, anything in isolation. Um, when I worked here at Lakeland, it's part of why I brought the brownies today, when I worked here at Lakeland, even though I held multiple titles, Never was there anything that I could have done or my team could have done in total isolation without, being, without help to be successful. We either had to partner with faculty, we had to partner with other um, departments across the college, we had outside partners. So every Sunday I would bake one or two batches of brownies and my goal was to get rid of them by the end of the week. And I would get rid of them by taking them to someone, thanking them for their help, and drop off the brownies. Because I'm not hardwired as a relationship person. Some people get like, their energy from relationships, and some people are task people. I'm a task person. I can come across as being very cold and very rude. Like I will walk into a room, and if I have something to do, I don't stop and ask you how you are and how your kids were this weekend. Like, it, it's not natural for me. I just want to get the job done, right? That doesn't mean that I don't value people. I just focus on the task. And knowing that that's my blind spot, I have to create frameworks for myself that force me to do the right thing sometimes. And so that's why I would bake the brownies. I know I need to say thank you, but I also have a list of 50 other things that I have to do. But the brownies are sitting there, so those remind me that I have to say thank you. So today, I adore Sam and Phil that are filming. I respect Connie and Gretchen who made the invitation. So I made sure that I baked brownies last night and brought them here to say thank you, because there's a good chance that I would have just come in here, been nervous, got all chatty and weird, and not said thank you and walked out. So that's why I did it. I do get chatty and weird. One of the other things that I was asked to touch on was communication skills. Um, I think with communication skills, for me, um, it's, it's the listening part, right? It's important that we listen to try to understand. Um, I think that as I've gotten older, I, I realize that that is probably the, the key to success in communication. It's not enough to hear someone, but I need to make sure that when they speak, 
Um, you know, I, I do a little bit of presenting on the um, behavior styles, which is something that I learned here at Lakeland as an administrator. And in part of that training, they talk about the communicator's creed. And the idea is that I'm 100% responsible for understanding what you just said to me. And I'm also 100% responsible for knowing that you understood what I just said to you, which means like I'm 200% responsible. And that's fair, right? If we want to try to make sure that there are any misunderstandings, it's really important that like we say to each other, this is what I heard you say, is that what you meant? And get that affirmation so I move forward and know that I'm moving forward in the right direction. And then the other one, like I just shared with you, that intent doesn't always equal impact. Like what I did to my team member yesterday at our staff meeting, for her to feel dismissed, that was not my intent. I thought all along she understood that I thought she was a rock star and that she was killing it, and that's why I didn't need to ask a million questions. And here, every time that I just glossed over everything, she felt like I didn't care about her work. So one of the questions was, you know, how is it that you help develop those communication skills? I think it's just practice. Everything to me is about being intentional. Um, I don't know, you guys might be just a ton better at everything than I am, but I will tell you, I have to practice everything and I have to be intentional about it. If I just go to my default, my default isn't my best version. Um, I know that like what comes to me naturally, it's not what's gonna put me at the top of my game, so I, I have to be intentional about things. And I think that we only get to practice communication with folks if we build trust and respect. Um, I would not have been able to have that conversation with my team member yesterday if over the past year she didn't believe that I actually cared about her. If I would have said those things to her and she was under the impression or didn't trust me and was under the impression that I was just giving her lip service, she would have left and not felt any better. But I think after we had the conversation yesterday, we both understood, like, here's the things we need to do differently. There were questions about work-life balance and networks. Um, this is me and the two most important people in my life. Those are my boys. And um, I will tell you with regards to work-life balance, the thing that I was most grateful for here at Lakeland and part of why this job was so important to me or working here was so important to me was that I had the flexibility that I never missed anything. I didn't miss a track meet, a football game, a cross country. I didn't miss anything, right? I say to my team where I'm at now and that when I was at the funeral home, we're a team that supports each other to make sure nobody misses family stuff. You know, I had the um, great gift when my grandfather was dying. He had Lou Gehrig's disease, which is just a horrible way to go. But you get Lou Gehrig's either top down or bottom up. And he got it bottom up, which meant that he lost his legs first. And then when he was dying is when he became bedridden. And in those last few weeks, um, my grandpa had owned a business. He was a self-made man. And um, his, his business partner folks were coming in to say goodbye. And I remember every single one of them, when they came in, he told them to retire as soon as possible. He didn't lay there preparing to go, wishing that he had more treasure, wishing he had worked more. He wanted more time with his family. And so that work-life balance, I know it is. When we use that word balance, it's important, right? Because you're trying to figure out how is it that you make the living and the resources that you need materially to support the lifestyle that you want. But you also need to understand how do you have the time to invest in the things that are going to really sustain you. Um, with networks, you know, again, it goes back to that servant leadership thing for me, right? Everybody's different. The way I think I have developed, you know, my social capital over the length of my career is I volunteer constantly. I like helping. I'm a helper. And so when I'm engaged in something, if I'm a member of Rotary, if I'm a member of the Chamber, if I'm working um, for another nonprofit, I make sure that I'm engaged and I'm actually physically involved. And this part about relationships, it's the key to every job I've ever had, right? I mean, whether it was at the funeral home or working here at the college or teaching high school kids, um, I said I'm, my energy comes from tasks, but I understand that my ability to be effective is rooted in my ability to develop relationships. One of the, one of the questions, um, what is a business decision you're most proud of and why? When I read that, I'm like, I have no idea. Um, and, 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 this is, and this is why, this is one of my favorite quotes. People know what they do, frequently they know why they do what they do, but what they don't know is what they do does. You know, it feels like a little bit of a tongue twister. But for me, 
I can tell you lots of great things that I've been a part of, things that I've gotten off the ground that I've seen grow and be better after I've left. I have you know, students that I taught that have went on to become teachers, which is an incredible gift. I had families that I served at the funeral home that I know I was able to do something for them to celebrate their loved one that they probably wouldn't have been able to experience anywhere else. I, I love the work that I do now because I know that every dollar we invest back in the community, we're helping to transform lives. That's all great stuff. I love it. Right? I've always been in, an in a position where I can help. So what's the best one? I don't know. And I don't think that I'll ever know. I don't think any of us do. I think the, the great gift or opportunity is that if you continue to just try to do good things and put good out there, good stuff's going to happen. You just may not know what it is. So the, what are your suggestions for graduates? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you, right? I mean, I, I'm 52 years old. I've had like, what, 85 jobs, and this won't be my last one. I'm going I'm to keep just going, right? And I think that's part of the journey. And I, I think being open to those things is what, what's so important. Um, but for me, the things that, that I would encourage you to think about is that, you know, there's a lot of online you can find core value exercises, you know, trying to figure out what your why is. What is it that motivates you? What's going to be most important to you? And trying to understand yourself so you can put yourself in a position where you can do good work and you can have peace. Um, for me, that grateful peace is so incredibly important. Um, you know, it, and it's not just like this squishy, warm and, you know, touchy type thing. The, the research is there, right? I mean, there's a whole school at Harvard rooted in happiness. And it is all grounded in gratitude, right? When they talk about rewiring our brain and our neural pathways and talk about like legit brain research, like every one of those, when they talk about the strategies, is rooted in gratitude. And like starting your day off and talking about what you're happy for. Um, I can't say enough about being kind. And again, not just because it's some meme on Facebook. Like the research tells us that it's the one way that you can change the trajectory of someone's life legitimately. So I love being able to talk to teachers because when I talk to classroom teachers, it's like you literally are in a position to transform the lives of the kids that are sitting in front of you. But the reality is every single one of us has the ability to change the trajectory of somebody's life just by being kind. And then the, the one that probably I struggle with the most is the being brave, right? Um, I was listening to some of the previous folks that have done this over the last couple years on the, the Lakeland website, and I stumbled across one that was talking about being brave. And I think that you know, everybody who's in the room today is at different points on the age continuum in your education pathway. Um, and I, don't, I, I would not say that I have regrets. I would not say that there's something that I would necessarily do over, because I don't know what the ripple effect of doing over would do to bring me here, right? So I, like, I, I don't like to entertain that type of mental exercise. But I do know that for me, being brave is one of my biggest challenges, right? I am risk averse. And I, I wish that for myself, I could push the envelope a little bit more. And then the one that I think is probably the most important or the thing that has applied to me the most is trying not to make decisions that close too many doors. You know, I started as a high school biology teacher with a master's in education administration. That master's in education administration is what positioned me to be here at Lakeland. When I came here at Lakeland, it was specifically on the side of doing research related to academic programs. But then I sort of stumbled into the nonprofit and public service center helping with strategic plans. And because I was helping with the strategic plans, that's what led me to do the work over at the political strategist, because that's what I was really doing with strategic planning work. And it was that strategic planning work that then opened my eyes to the funeral home, which I will tell you was a fantastic job for me. It was the first time that my vocation and my faith came together and I was able to help people in, in a really meaningful way. And then that led me to United Way. So for me, I just keep following the path that, that's in front of me and have tried not to close too many doors. That's in a nutshell. So I think now there's supposed to be questions. I don't know. <laughs> and I mean, and I don't say that to, I don't, I don't say that to, to be snarky. I mean, my, my hope would be, right, before you're actually full-time employed as a physical therapy assistant, that somewhere along the line, when you've done the shadowing and the observations, you have a sense of it, right? I mean, you shouldn't end up employed full-time for the first time be like, oh my gosh, I don't like touching people, right? I mean, should, there, there should have been something earlier on, right? Um, you know, there's a difference between hating what you're doing 
and hating what you're doing at that place, right? I, I think that if physical therapy assistant and you're going through the clinical training of that and you're having that experience, you know if that type of work is the type of work that you want to do. The real question might be the environment in which you want to do it. So maybe working in a nursing home with older folks is the thing that's going to fill your heart, or maybe that's the thing that you want anything to do with. So I think, you know, as much as you can in advance trying to figure those things out, and to your point, there does come a time, right, that you have to make hard decisions about what's best for me financially and what's best for me here. But again, this is the time right now while you're preparing to answer some of those bigger questions. And so, you know, I used to always say when I worked with high school age kids, um, if you're planning on going to college and you see yourself as being an athlete, right, you want to go there and you want to play football, then you need to find someone who's playing football, who's in the degree program that you're in, that you can talk to about what it really means to be in that situation. So to the extent that you're able to talk to people that are physical therapy assistants, that are moms, and I don't know if you said you were a single mom or not, so single mom doing that work, like find those people. And what's great about like social media today <laughs> is you literally can put that call out to the universe and you'll find those people. You know, 30 years ago, it'd be really difficult to find something that was such a niche, but you can do that. And so that would be my recommendation. Well, those are two different things too, right? I mean, burnout, so I will tell you, I am programmed, did I just, I'm sorry, I just smacked the microphone. I am programmed, I am hardwired to be a workaholic, 100%, right? There have been several times over the course of the last 30 years where I have found myself going, like, what did I just do, right? And so I think going back to that part about like knowing yourself and being able to set the boundaries and finding the environment that works for you. It's a challenging time right now though. I mean, and, and it's across industries where people aren't finding good people to work, right? So the blessing and the curse of being the good person at work right now is you'll find a job, but you'll work really, really hard, right? So I mean, I think those are some of the things to think about. But the other part I would say to you is also Physical therapy assistant is one off-ramp. So what does the rest of the path look like? What does it take for you to be physical therapy assistant and as physical therapist what you want to move on to next? Or as a therapy assistant, you know, do you want to figure out how you can get into administration and that sort of thing? Like figure out, like don't, again, this is through my lens. I've never wanted where I'm at to be the last possible stop, right? I want to know that where I'm at, I can see what the next jumping off points are going to be. Not because I'm a job jumper and not because like, I assume going in I'm not going to be happy. I know that I feel better knowing that I have options. I'm not the type of person who ever feels good backed into a corner, if that makes sense. That's a fantastic question. Um, so I don't know how to answer this without sounding like I'm really full of myself, okay? So please know that I am and I'm not. So high school biology teacher, definitely I applied for that particular job. Um, I applied at Leadership Lake County. Leadership Lake County opened up an entire new world to me in terms of the folks that I met and the networking. It was a direct result of being at that job that there was an opportunity presented to me here. And so then from here, I was approached to take another job. So um, I still had to make a decision, right? I mean, it wasn't like just because somebody came up and said, hey, do you want to do this? I had other opportunities while I was here that I passed on that were presented to me. Um, the funeral home was the same sort of thing. Like, again, because of the work that I had done for them, then I had the opportunity to go there. So uh, with United Way, it was a little bit different in that the position was opening up. There were folks that wanted me to apply that were reaching out. And um, for me, I had to make the decision at that point of whether or not to even apply because it didn't make sense to go through the process and put people through the exercise if I wasn't going to be serious about it. And so for me, that was probably the hardest decision of all of the lefts and, and rights that I've taken because like I said, the, the funeral home job was the very first one where like 
my faith, my, my spiritual life, and what I did for money came together. And I really, like I went to the funeral home thinking that I was gonna be exclusively back of house, process, strap plan, HR, that sort of thing. And because of when I started and what COVID was happening in the state of Ohio at that time, I ended up serving families. And it was the greatest thing I've ever done. Still, I, I, I really enjoyed that work. So, but for me, the move over to United Way was driven by the fact that I knew I could increase the sort of footprint of the impact that I was having, and that's what I wanted to be able to be a part of. It's probably not hard to tell from what I just did here today. I have sort of an open book at this point, right? So I have people in my life that are very close to me that I tell them it's their job to reel me back in. I tell my team at work, right? I come in, we have our staff meetings, and if I worked with me, I'd be like, what is wrong with this woman, right? I come in, I'm just right? Someone at that table has to be brave enough to say, Dion, stop, right? Like, there's only so many things we can get done. What are we gonna focus on? And sometimes you would think that should be my role given my job, but sometimes I just come in and I've got all of this stuff. Like I didn't get, um, I didn't get my official diagnosis with my ADD until about four years ago, right? When I did, it was like, this all makes sense. Things that have been driving everybody else crazy about me, <laughs> how many credit cards I lose, I never know where my keys are, blah, 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 all that. So like I tell people right up front, like here are my blind spots and I need you to pull me back. I'm not good at managing myself. I own that, like I'm not. If you let me wander, like, you may not see me for three weeks because I will just bury myself in things. And so I have people that I rely on to, to help me with that. But I also own that there are periods of time for me that that's just how it's going to be, right? And then I have to give myself the grace to say, I've just pushed it really hard for X number of time and I'm gonna take a day. So we went at United Way about a month ago. In the span of two weeks, we had a kickoff, we had a retreat for our cabinet, we had a golf outing, we had a kickoff for education, and um, we had an, another uh, small event, literally within two weeks. I told the team on a Friday afternoon, like Sunday, unless somebody's like lost a loved one and you have to tell me you're not coming to work on Monday, I don't wanna hear from anybody. I don't wanna to talk to anybody, I'm not replying to anything. Like I just took a day and I didn't look at emails, I didn't look at texts, and I just shut down. And, and that's important for me other people have other strategies, so. I mean, I think that what I recognized in the transparency, I mean, the, the word transparency is important, but I think I've sort of converted that also in my head to vulnerability, right? Um, my ability to be transparent is risky. I don't know how people are going to judge or what they're going to assume or you know that sort of thing. And it's also risky because it makes me accountable. So if I'm going to sit there and tell you that these are the things that are most important to me and that like I want you to push back and then the moment you push back I'm a jerk about it, right? Like that didn't help. Um, so the, the vulnerability piece for me, the, the transparency is about culture. I, I want to work in a place where people are safe to be who they are, right? If I am responsible or contributing to a culture where people cannot feel safe to be who they are, then they are spending precious energy trying to be something they're not, right? And we only have so much bandwidth. And, and I really believe that, you know, these types of things that we talk about for our students that are community college students that are trying to manage kids and are trying to manage a job and try to manage their classes and you know keep a roof over their head and all that stuff and we talk about decision fatigue and how like people get worn down like I, I believe in my heart that all of that's true right and I don't know what's going on at home for folks that I work with I, I have to take them at their word and whether or not they're okay or not but I can't be part of creating more obstacles for people Right? So for me, the, the transparency piece is just as selfish as anything else. Because if I can be transparent and vulnerable to create a culture where people feel safe doing that, then we'll be more effective. Then I'm not going to have to try to tape people back together at the end of the day because they've wasted so much time trying to be something else.
Um, it was probably more circumstance than anything. So I, I really did love classroom teaching. It was the, the best job that I had um, because I had been sick. Um, it took a lot of time, energy, and money for me to become a mom. Uh, we, we did in vitro fertilization for the, me to have both of my kids. And so by the time I got to that stage, I was like, I'm going to stay home as much as I can. So um, for me to be able to work part time is what put me at Leadership Lake County. And then by that time, it just, I got on that path. So I don't think it was nearly as intentional as it was just the set of circumstances. Nope. I'll tell you why. Um, so uh, I grew up. I grew up in poverty, right? Um, the the way that I stumbled across the adverse childhood experience survey actually was when I was here uh, at Lakeland doing the nonprofit work. The Lake County YMCA invited me to come in and do some planning for them, and love the Y. I spent every Saturday morning at the Y in fourth and fifth grade with my friend Jenny and her family. Um, ended up, my first job was working at the game room, popping popcorn, selling slushies. Did day camp there. Uh, the women there taught me about customer service. It was the day camp people that told me I should go into education. Uh, love, 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 love the Y. Doing the planning, and somebody says something about scholarships. And I'm like, what's a scholarship? And they're like, well, when a family can't afford to pay, we make sure that they can attend. And it's like at the end of the sixth sense when all the pieces come together and you realize that Bruce Willis was actually dead. Nobody's seen the movie, I'm sorry. And uh, spoiler alert, um, it was like all the pieces came together for me. And I was like, holy cow, I had to have been scholarshiped because I never had a Y card, ever. My mom, there's no way, right? I mean, like she was doing everything she could to keep food on the table. And I realized in that moment that those people loved on me hard for years for free, and nobody asked me for anything, right? And it literally set the foundation. I won't say that the Y is exclusively responsible for every good thing that's happened to me, and Dick Bennett would love for me to say that, but it was truly part of the transformation for my life in terms of being able to get on the right path. And so I have a special appreciation for that. Um, while I was here at Lakeland, we, we um, engaged in training in the poverty simulation where we would go out to school districts and nonprofits and invite people to um, simulate what it's like to, to survive in poverty. And people role play for four 15 minute weeks. And we say at the beginning, don't treat this like a game. I know it'll feel like it. You've got this plastic jewelry and these baby dolls and fake money, but by the end it's incredibly stressful. And it is incredibly stressful. And I had a woman once, I was doing this at the Bedford schools who came up to me. She was a teacher, she's choking back tears. And she says, I love this simulation. I love what you're doing. I'm not going to participate in the debrief. She said, the family I'm simulating has more disposable income than I do right now. And she was going through a divorce and was living apart with her kids and was just fighting to make ends meet. And so there's a certain tyranny of the moment when people are living in poverty that, again, that decision fatigue, that exhaustion, that keeps them from being able to access those things. I get what you're saying, and, and we hear this argument all the time, and, and having skin in the game so people have accountability and, and they, they understand. And, and I think that there are people that maybe take advantage, but I would rather hedge on the side of the people that are taking advantage and make it completely accessible than to create any additional obstacles for the people that need it. We were doing a produce distribution in partnership with the Greater Cleveland Food Bank and the Mentor Schools at the end of June. And um, the folks at Mentor, they decided the first distribution, we just do 6,000 pounds, right? just 6,000 pounds. And it gets dropped off, and we're supposed to pack from 11 until 12, and at 12 o'clock, we're distribute from 12 until 2. By 11.20, the number of cars lined up from the football stadium out to Center Street. We need to call the police to get traffic taken care of. We want to distribute for two hours. By 12.20, we had distributed 6,000 pounds of food. And the thing that struck me wasn't the demand. The thing that struck me was the number of people who pulled up and apologized, explained why they were there. I'm sorry. We live in Lake County. There should be a minimum standard. People should have dignity. 
Like, no one should have to apologize to me because I'm giving them a box of bananas, right? Like, we should all be comfortable knowing that everybody eats in our community, that nobody stays somewhere where they're not safe because there isn't somewhere for them to go, that everybody can have a roof over their head. So I am a very strong advocate for if we have it, we need to make it available to folks, right? Like, life is too, too hard to make it harder on people. And my whole thing at United, and I didn't want to make this United Way thing, so I apologize. But, you know, I always say it's not a silver bullet, it's a silver buckshot. That if someone is struggling but is underinsured, chances are they're probably not eating as much as they're supposed to be. If someone is living in a household where food scarcity is an issue and they have young children, chances are those kids aren't getting the support they need to be kindergarten ready. So I understand what you're saying, but I think that it's important for us to make sure we remove as many obstacles as possible because I'm living proof, and the jury's out on whether or not I'm doing a good job, right? But I am living proof of when we invest in the people who are most vulnerable, that some of those folks are grateful, turn that into their mission, and add back. And so I think it's really important that we create those pathways. I will get off my soapbox now. Yep, hang on to good people. That's the key, right? Like I used to say when I would do student success and would help with first year experience and we would do orientation, one of our pieces of recommendations to students was to always sit up front, meet your faculty members. The people that teach here, teach here because they understand the power of the community college. I, I would tell you that there's no more important institution in Lake County than Lakeland Community College. And I don't say that just because I worked here. Like I believe that in my heart. The, the people that are here in the Women's Center, in the Men's Center, in the Tutoring Center, the people that teach your classes, when you start to feel overwhelmed, those are the people to hang on to. I can share with you, when I was going through um, chemotherapy, I stayed home for one semester. I was, I was back here in Cleveland. And my advisor called me every single week and said, Dion, you need to come back. This is where you belong. If I had went to college for one year, got sick, went home, and never went back, I still would have accomplished more than anybody in my family had up to that point. I had, I had a pass, but it was because he called every single week and reminded me that I should be there, that I went back. And so I do think the key, I know it sounds trite, is people. So when you start to feel overwhelmed, figure out who the resources are here. Because again, it's not the Women's Center, it's Gloria and Mary. It's not the Tutoring Center, give me the name of the tutor, right? It's not about the program, it's about the people. The people are what make the difference. I don't know, right? I mean, I, I figure it, it seems ironic, um, and I, I say this all the time, cancer at 18 was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, it, it helped me really have a focus, right? Um, I, I think that, you know, we know from the research that people, when they have these sort of life-altering moments, that, you know, that sort of mental trigger can be flipped. So for me, I feel grateful that I, I had that while it's still a heartbreaking and, and terrible thing that occurred. Um, you know, I have two boys that you saw that, you know, through my lens live a pretty charmed life. They might argue differently. But, um, you know, and, and I try to help them all the time with, like, talking about, like, what's most important to you? How do you figure out what's most important to you? My younger son of the two, Gabriel, I, I refer to him as, like, my servant warrior. If I have to go do a walkathon, if I'm going to go, you know, hand out food, whatever it is, if he's not working, he'll come with me. He'll volunteer no matter what. And the reason is that he did a tour of Project Hope, which is the homeless shelter here in Lake County. And when he did the tour, they took him into the family room. And that particular family room, I think they had two or three kids. So the entire family's worldly possessions were in two Rubbermaid containers. And he said when he saw that, the rest of his life, he will volunteer. Right? So for him, that service thing got triggered by something entirely different. Now my older son, I don't think he's wired the same way. That doesn't mean that he's a bad kid, doesn't mean he's a bad person. I mean, he and other people that I know, like their driving purpose is about providing security, right? Like they want to do as much as they can, how they can, so that they can go ahead and make things better for the people around them. So it's different for everybody, 
So I think that's part of the challenge is trying to figure out what is the thing that you know resonates with you. There's people in the room right now that know, like I need to work with people or I need to not work with people. There's people that know, like I could sit in front of a computer all day and look at numbers and like I like problem solving and that stuff makes me feel good. There's other people here that are like, I need to be able to talk to folks and feel like I'm helping. You know, but there's all of those interest surveys out there, but I really do think to me, even more important than the sort of career interest surveys are the ones that help you figure out your core values. But again, that's just through my lens.